Right, hello everybody. I think we'll start now. Um, welcome to our digital glaucoma support group tonight. And um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, my name is Philippa Mason and I am the Glaucoma UK Development Manager for Scotland. Today, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrew Tatham. Andrew is an ophthalmic surgeon specialising in the treatment of glaucoma and cataracts. He works in Edinburgh and has been at the Princess Alexandra Eye Pavilion for over 10 years. Andrew is also an NHS Scotland research clinician, which makes him a, a great person to be talking about glaucoma research. Andrew's kindly agreed to talk to us today about the research and developments into glaucoma treatments that we hope to become a reality. I'm so glad so many of you decided to spend your evening with us. Um, the format today um, will involve, let me just check, uh, yes, Facebook is sharing, that's absolutely wonderful. The format today will involve me just doing a little bit of a faff here, then handing over to Andrew for a presentation. And then afterwards, we're going to have a Q&A session. Now, please post any questions you have for Andrew in the Q&A box. Um, and if you're on Zoom, that will be at the bottom of the screen. You can write your questions in there. And don't forget, you might not have any questions of your own, but you might see a question in there that you think, you know, that's a good question. I like that one. So click on the little thumbs up and that will tell us that more than one person is interested in the response. Welcome to any Facebook viewers we have today. You're also welcome to ask questions and you can do this just by commenting on the feed and they will get passed over to me. If you're new today, welcome to our digital groups. Just for your knowledge, you should be able to see Andrew and I, but we cannot see or hear you. So please ensure that if you have got questions, you're writing those into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Now to track how well these webinars are in terms of learning, we're gonna launch two short polls. So I'm just gonna do the first one first. This is the first chance to get interactive. And if you can just answer this question on the screen, how much do you know about the future of glaucoma treatments? And if you can fill in your answers there, I can see people uh, putting those answers in. That's absolutely fantastic. I'll leave that up for a minute or so. Now, I think that's, let's have a oh, look at, yes, you've all come back. That's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to end that in just a second or so. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, and now what I'm going to do is um, not too much of an introduction, really, uh, any more of an introduction. I'm going to hand over to our speaker for today, Andrew. Um, now, don't forget, as I said, please put your Q&As into the box and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Andrew, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Philippa. Um, it's really nice to be with you this evening and thank you for everyone tuning in at home. Um, can I just check with you, Philippa? Can you see my screen? Are you, um, I can indeed. That's, that's going well. Great. Yeah. Super. Well, I don't know what it's like where you are this evening, but it's a very wet, stormy day in Edinburgh. Um, so it feels quite nice to be inside you know, um, you know, share, sharing this with you. So um, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the exciting things that are happening with glaucoma research, um, talking a little bit about progress that we've made over the last few years, and then talking about some of the things that are perhaps just around the corner. And one of the great things about this is some of this research has been supported by Glaucoma UK and the, the fantastic you know, uh, charity work that it, that it does in supporting glaucoma research. Um, so I'll, I'll just start straight away. And um, there's probably a sort of a wide range of people listening and some of you may have just found out you have glaucoma some probably have had it for many years and are glaucoma experts yourselves you know um, have, having a lot of in-depth knowledge about the condition but glaucoma essentially is um, damage to the optic nerve the nerve that connects the eye to the brain so um, it's defined as a chronic progressive it tends to get worse over time if not treated um, optic neuropathy, so damage to the optic nerve. And there are two main types of glaucoma. There is open angle and angle closure glaucoma. And it's important just to have a, 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 a basic understanding of the difference because some of the research that I'll be talking about addresses 
one type of glaucoma and perhaps not the other. So the vast majority of glaucoma in the UK is open angle. Um, and the most people who have glaucoma, it's due to the pressure inside the eye being too high, and it's the high pressure that damages the optic nerve. And the pressure inside the eye is caused by the circulation of fluid called aqueous, which is a clear fluid in the front of the eye. And this drains away through a channel, which is in the angle of the eye. I'm not sure if you can actually see my pointer, but uh, it's, it's in the angle of the eye. And for most people, the angle is open. Uh, open angle glaucoma. So the blockage is caused by an obstruction further down the drainage system that we can't see, a blockage beyond the angle. But a smaller proportion of people have angle closure glaucoma, and that's in those people we can see that the angle is is closed. It's, it's, there's, there's contact basically between the iris, the colored part of the eye, and the drainage channel of the eye. So it's important to understand the differences. And for people who have angle closure glaucoma, the lens the, the lens inside the eye often contributes. So as we get older and we get cataracts, the lens in our eye grows, and then that can cause angle closure. So um, moving on from that, um, how do we detect glaucoma? Well, for most people, people don't tend to have symptoms. They don't tend to notice that their vision is reduced. That's not, that doesn't happen until the glaucoma can be called becomes quite severe. So most people who are detected glaucoma are, are detected just at a routine visit to the opticians. And these are the sort of tests that we would do. So we would check the pressure, um, but we would also check the peripheral vision. Um, and that's the test that I think most people dislike the most, the visual field test. Um, but then we also look at the nerve and see, is there optic nerve damage? And we can look at it um, on a slit lamp using a special lens, or we can take a, a photograph or a scan of the optic nerve, OCT. Um, so that's how we conventionally would detect glaucoma and also monitor whether it's getting worse. So. Um, here's, here's some examples. These are some quite small images, but at the top here, there are five pictures of a visual field for somebody's left eye. And the first visual field, there's not very many, many gray spots on it. That visual field looks pretty good. But unfortunately, this person, over time, there are more gray and black patches appearing on the printout, which shows worsening visual field. So this is how we would determine whether someone with glaucoma is getting worse by checking the visual fields for change over time. And at the bottom, there is an image of the nerve. Um, this is an OCT scan of the nerve. And we measure the nerve to see how thick it is. And in glaucoma, the nerve tends to thin over time. And we can actually plot the thickness of the nerve. So there are, there are several dots on a plot here showing the the change in the nerve thickness over time between this person being 69 at the beginning and 76 at their last visit. And we can see there's a gradual decline in the thickness of the nerve. So this person's glaucoma is getting worse. So that was just a brief introduction for those of you who are new to glaucoma about what it is, the two main types, open angle and closed angle, how we find out about it and how we monitor it at the moment. And then we can then from then think about how things might happen in the future. Now, glaucoma is a big problem. Um, for, obviously, for people, individuals affected, it's a big problem for um, society, though, in general. And that's one of the reasons it's a huge problem is because it's very common. And we looked at uh, uh, across Scotland, what proportion of people are prescribed a glaucoma eye drop? And the, the findings were quite surprising because overall, over 1%, over 1 in 100 of the population across Scotland during a given year had been prescribed a glaucoma eye drop. 1 in 100 people, it's huge. And it becomes more common with age. So each of these bars on the, on the chart here um, is, is representing a, 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 an age gap, a five-year sort of age gap. And you can see that those that were 90 plus on the far right there's almost 10% of people who are 90 plus who've been prescribed a glaucoma medication. So glaucoma is a really common problem. So we're going to look then at important recent research and some current and future research. So let, let's look at some of the important progress that have been, has been made over the, the last few years. Now, when we're looking at sort of studies, 
Um, we often like to think of, uh, as, as um, clinicians, we like to think of clever sort of acronyms and, lot of, um, and, that, and so you'll find there's lots of, it's like an alphabet soup really, lots of letters used to describe these studies. And this is sort of timeline showing some of these alphabet studies um, between sort of 1998 and, and 2019. And, and these are the sort of that have been picked out as the sort of really important studies during this period. And there's too many here to go into, and, and, but, but I thought it'd be useful to look at the most recent four or five. So the, the ones since 2015, because actually most of these have taken place in the UK. So the UK really is at the forefront of glaucoma research at the moment, it could be argued. So the first of these um, is the UK glaucoma treatment study. And actually some of you might have been participants in one of these studies because they're all conducted in the UK. So this is known as the UK GTS. And this was the first study which was comparing a single eye drop for glaucoma, in this case, latanoprost, which is the most commonly used eye drop, versus placebo. So that was just basically a drop of water compared to the actual drug. And that's really important to compare to placebo because you've probably heard of the placebo effect. And to see if a medication works, it's important that the person taking the medication doesn't know if they're actually taking it or not. And the person taking the measurements of the eye also doesn't know. So there's no chance of bias in the study. Um, so this was comparing latanoprost versus placebo in over 500 people. And what we found in this study, which was led by uh, Ted Garway Heath at Moorfields, who's the Glaucoma UK professor of glaucoma, um, th they found that lowering eye pressure helps preserve vision. Um, so that you might think, well, well, of course it does. But this was the first study, believe it or not, to sh show that using a really good methodology against placebo. So they found that of those people that took latanoprost, about 15% got worse over a two year period um, versus a quarter um, who were taking the placebo. So it was a significantly reduced the number of people who deteriorated over this time. And, but the other thing it showed is actually that sometimes overall, there's a large number of people who are at low risk of losing vision. So sometimes there's a fear of blindness. There's a fear that, you, that a person will deteriorate when actually the reality is that their risk is quite low. Um, so that was really interesting. And they found that some things were um, increased the risk of deterioration. One was having high pressure, of course, but also having a disc hemorrhage. So sometimes you can be seen to have a small spot of blood on the optic nerve, and that can be a risk factor for deterioration. So that was the first really important study, the UK GTS. The second is the light study. And this again was led by um, one of the consultants at Moorfields, Gus Gazard. And in this study, um, they compared eye drops versus laser, SLT, which is it stands for, um, we, we all call it SLT because it's quite a long uh, uh, phrase. It's selective laser trabeculoplasty. So you can forget that, just call it SLT because that's what we all call it. But in this study then they had people who just found out they had glaucoma or they had high pressure in their eye but not yet glaucoma and they randomized people to have SLT or eye drops as their very first treatment. And the results were surprising because SLD did far better than perhaps we would have thought. So at three years, 74% of people who had SLT first still had a good pressure and were not needing eye drops. So that was a really interesting result. And also they found that fewer people who had SLT first, um, so uh, um, none actually at three years, had needed glaucoma surgery versus 11 who had eye drops first. So this showed us that SLT is a very reasonable first line treatment. It's not suitable for everyone though. And we have to remember these were people who just found out they had glaucoma. So they were at an earlier stage of their disease. And just uh, two weeks ago, the results looking at six years after SLT were published and SLT was still doing really well. So here about almost 70% of people who had had, had a SLT first were still not needing eye drops six years after the SLT. But many of these people had had the laser repeated because SLT does wear off over time. And that um, was a really good example of how 
uh, funded research can completely change practice because shortly afterwards, um, the national guide guidelines, so we have guidelines from an organization called NICE, and they changed based really on that study. And now they recommend SLTs offered as a first line treatment. So we've mentioned the UK GTS, the light study. The next one I think that's interesting is Eagle. Um, so you can see another alphabet soup, Eagle. Um, now this looked at that less common type of glaucoma at angle closure. So um, what, what uh, we traditionally did with people who had angle closure would be to perform laser. We'd use a different type of laser to SLT. It was a laser called an iridotomy, which makes is basically a laser to make a tiny hole in the iris to help the fluid get access to the drainage channel and help the open the, the angle open up. Um, so in the past, we would have done laser, but the, this study asked the question, well, we know that in people with angle closure, one of the causes is having a cataract or having a big lens. But what if that person hasn't got a cataract and we just you know, do a cataract operation, we remove the lens of the eye before they've got cataract? Okay, so we call that a clear lens extraction. It's essentially the same as a cataract operation, but it's done not for cataract reasons, it's done to treat glaucoma. And the Eagle study shows that for people who had primary angle closure glaucoma, removing the lens was a very effective treatment, and it was probably more effective than the laser iridotomy. So this again was a study that changed practice. And so for those people with angle closure glaucoma or high risk of it, we sometimes would recommend now a, a lens extraction operation instead of the laser. Lasers still though used for lower risk people. So the next important study is the ZAP study. So this one wasn't done in the UK, this was in, um, in uh, China. And this looked at people also with angle closure, but people who hadn't yet got glaucoma. So people who had a narrow drainage channel in their eye, but um, didn't have um, particularly high pressure or glaucoma damage. So these are lower risk people. So these are people where we definitely would have done laser in the past. And in this study, they randomized people to have laser in one eye or nothing in the other, just to watch and see what happened. And what the study showed is actually it's very reasonable in people who are low risk just to watch, don't necessarily need to do the laser iridotomy. Um, so, because very few people, in, even in the untreated eye, over six years of follow-up actually had developed glaucoma or high pressure. And so again, this has led to a change in practice. So we have other guidelines, guidelines from the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. And because of this, um, this pivotal study, um, they've decided now to divide up these um, people at risk of angle closure glaucoma into those at high risk and low risk. And it's only the ones at high risk that we would recommend having the laser treatment. So it's, it's change practice. I'll just skip through that. Actually. So that's um, a brief summary of the studies on the right here. Those, those um, was it four or five? It was four, wasn't it? We've been to the UK GTS, the Eagle study, um, the light study and ZAP. So those on the right hand side. That's where, that's already published though. That, that's an example of how studies change practice. But what about the questions that we still need to answer? And there are a lot actually, and, um, but I picked out a few which I thought were interesting because we're making progress in trying to answer some of these questions. So I'll just go through them one by one. So one important question is, what's the best treatment for somebody who has an advanced glaucoma when they're diagnosed? Because fortunately, we have very good optometrists and most people have regular eye tests. And for most people, glaucoma is picked up at a fairly early stage. And that's really good news because the most the biggest risk of losing vision from glaucoma is just being picked up too late. So that's why it's really important to spread the word about glaucoma among your relatives. Um, and what about though for those people who are diagnosed and they've already lost a lot of their visual field? Well, in the past, we would have given drops and seen if the drops worked and maybe monitored for a while, maybe tried other drops, added a third drop maybe. And then if nothing was really working, perhaps done an operation like a trabeculectomy. But the TAG study looked at whether 
for these people, whether that might be losing valuable time and just going straight to have a trabeculectomy before eye drops was a reasonable thing to do. And the results of the study, um, which were just published last year, um, basically showed that performing trabeculectomy as a very first off treatment for these people was a very reasonable thing to do because it would give you a lower pressure overall. So people had an average pressure of about 12 when they had the trabeculectomy versus about 15 when they were taking eye drops. And for a lot of people, that difference wouldn't really matter. But if you've got very bad glaucoma, having a, you know, getting that very low pressure is probably a, a good thing to have. So over a long period of time, that, that could be very important for preserving more vision. Um, the other thing that is interesting um, is whether, you know, all, all of the treatments I've mentioned so far look at lowering the intraocular pressure. We don't really have any treatments that work on protecting the optic nerve by other means, by not necessarily lowering pressure. And one um, interesting uh, vitamin, actually, which is nicotinamide, not nicotine, nicotinamide, which is a type of vitamin B3, is currently under evaluation. And vitamin B3 is really important for um, the energy producing part of our cells, the mitochondria, they're called. And um, the, the, the first sort of really interesting study looking at this was published uh, uh, from Australia, from Melbourne. And it was quite a small number of people. They only had 49 people with glaucoma, but they gave people nicotinamide as a tablet for six weeks. Um, and then they gave them a placebo for six weeks. And they looked at the function of the optic nerve using this, um, it's, it's an electrical measurement of the function of the nerve. It works, I suppose, in a little, a little bit similarly to how an ECG would in monitoring the electrical activity of your heart. You can actually shine a light on the eye and measure the activity of your optic nerve in your retina. Um, and they actually found that there was some um, slight improvement in retinal function, optic nerve function, even with this short period of nicotinamide. But we need to be cautious because this is quite a small number of people. and We don't really know how long people might need to take it for and the dose or whether it actually works at all. But um, a large study has now commenced in the UK evaluating nicotinamide and its potential role in glaucoma. So I think that's something quite exciting for the future. And this is classed as we call it, we use this term for this kind of uh, drug as, as a neuroprotective, a neuroprotective medication. The other question I think is interesting is about laser. We've, we've shown SLT is really good, um, but could you actually do better? Could you make it easier to do or even more effective? And something that's in development is something known as um, direct selective laser trabeculoplasty or direct SLT. So when we do SLT, we place a contact lens on the surface of the eye and um, we have to do 100 individual laser shots all the way around the drainage channel. So it's, it's quite a quick procedure and it's very comfortable, but with direct SLT, it literally put all of those shots in just a couple of seconds. So it's very, very quick. Um, and there is a study that's being conducted at the moment called the Glorious um, Study. Uh, they've got to give them credit for coming up with that, I think. Um, but uh, this, this is looking at SLT versus direct SLT. So we should have the results of that um, in, within the next couple of years. And that's, so that's another interesting potential development in laser treatments for glaucoma. I think the other interesting area is whether there's a better way to monitor glaucoma, because I'm sure you realize and appreciate more than most people uh, know the, the limitations of how we monitor glaucoma at the moment. You know, it's done by a visit in the hospital usually and waiting a long time usually, and then having those tests that we don't really like, like the visual field test. It can be very time consuming and we can't actually check things very often. Um, but for other chronic diseases, um, there are other ways to monitor it at home, in fact. So for diabetes and for high blood pressure, people can monitor things at home. And I don't, we don't know if that's going to actually be useful for glaucoma yet, um, but there are ways to do it now, and these are under evaluation. So this is a video of somebody who's learning how to check their own pressure at home using a device called the eye care. So they basically just hold it in front of their eye, press a button, and it will tell them what the pressure is. So 
Now, is that is that going to be helpful for some people? Potentially. Might it make people worry unnecessarily? Potentially. Um, is it any better than having your pressure checked every six months in a clinic? We don't know. But it's interesting. And um, I think it would be uh, something that needs to be evaluated over coming coming years. The other thing that could be measured at home is visual fields. And um, you know, with the technology we have now in, available to, for almost everyone, you know, tablet computers and even mobile phones, might it be possible to check visual fields using these devices? And there are ways that you can do that. Um, but again, there are none that are actually um, uh, sort of proven or commercially available yet. But I think over the next sort of five years or so, it's very likely that these might come uh, come into play, and um, they might. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think they'll replace the clinical visual field test, but they might give us more information. The other thing I think that's interested in is: is there a better way to deliver medications to the eye? Because um, you now taking a tablet is relatively easy, but putting an eye drop in is very challenging. And also, of course, there are the side effects that one gets with eye drops, often cosmetic side effects, but sometimes side effects on the whole body, particularly with beta blockers, for instance. So there, there might be a better way to deliver that medication to the eye other than by the means of an eye drop. Perhaps then it wouldn't be needed to be taken every day. Maybe there'll be sustained release medication that could last three, four, five, six months, or even longer, potentially. And I think this is a really exciting area under evaluation. So this could actually improve people's um, adherence to medication, because understandably, you know, we all forget, we forget to put our drops in, we would forget to, uh, you know, we might go on holiday and forget our drops. And um, so I think, um, you know, having, having sustained release has potential potential uh, benefit there and wouldn't necessarily give the same side effects and the other really interesting thing is that when we put a drop in um, often lots of it ends up on the cheek or going down the back of the nose and mouth so it doesn't doesn't actually get where we want it to go and by putting um, a sustained release medication onto the eye it could you could actually get higher concentrations of the drug where they're really needed so i think this is really interesting and one potential way to deliver this would be in a something called a punctal plug. So this is a plug that is put into the tear duct and the plug is embedded with medication, which slowly is released over time. Now, that sounds very interesting because it's not really very invasive. It sounds like that would be very safe. But what potential problems might be that the plug could fall out and you don't notice it's fallen out and then it's not working. So there are some there are some potential problems, but I think it's very interesting. The other way would be to have um, this device, which is actually inserted into the eye. And it's like a small reservoir that slowly releases the medication over time. So that's very interesting. And then there's there's um, a product, actually, that, which is already available in the US called Jurista or Bamatopros slow release. And this is a, it's a little bit like a dissolvable stitch. It's the same sort of material, but it's soaked in a medication called Bamatopros, which some of you might be using as an eye drop. It's also known as Lumigan. And one implant can last, um, uh, well, the implant will dissolve slowly over about a year and it's designed to provide medication over about four months, but we we were a site in um, Edinburgh for this for this study evaluating the the implant, and what we found was that over eighty percent of people who had three implants remained off any eye drops or additional medication twelve months after their last implant. I think another important challenge is whether we can better identify people at high risk of losing vision, because many people with glaucoma change very slowly. So all of these um, lines, these colored lines represent different people. So person A at the top here was picked up. They were diagnosed really early and they haven't changed very much. They haven't gone downhill very much. Whereas person E, this red line, they were also picked up quite early, but they have got worse very, very quickly. So how do you tell on that first visit whether you have person E, the red line, or person A, the one you don't need to worry so much about? And that can be very hard to know at the moment. 
But one way we might better tell is through our genetics. And the genetics of glaucoma are very complicated. It's not like some conditions where one gene causes the problem. For most people, it's a complex interplay of our genetic factors and perhaps environmental factors as well, combining to cause the problem. But what's been shown recently is we have over 100 locations within our DNA that are associated with glaucoma. So it is complicated. But if you look at all of those locations together, you can actually quite accurately predict, even when someone's born, just from their genetics, whether they're likely to have glaucoma in the future. So I think this is very interesting. So we might in the future be able to decide not who is just who is at most uh, risk of losing vision, but who needs more close monitoring as well. Maybe if we find people have a low genetic risk, we could see them once every two or three years, or those at higher risk, we see more often. Another interesting area is imaging, taking image in the, the eye. And I've shown you some images of the optic nerve at the back of the eye, which is important. But if we think about why do people get glaucoma, it's usually because of a problem with the drainage channel in the eye. And these are some photographs showing the drainage channel. So we're now very sophisticated cameras and ways of taking pictures of the drainage channel of the eye, which will probably improve our understanding of exactly why people get blocked drainage channels. And there's even ways now that we can see the movement of the aqueous, the fluid draining in the eye, draining away in these veins, they're called aqueous veins. So we can see, we can see how if the, these, these vessels, these pathways become blocked, that somebody might develop high pressure in their eye. And maybe we'll have ways to target these with surgery, for instance, or medications and improve the drainage. So some really exciting developments. So we've come a long way and there's been some landmark studies and I'm really excited to see what's going to be the landmark studies of the future. Uh, but we can only come this far thanks to very kind volunteers, people who have glaucoma and they're happy to take part in research. And also due to funding because the funding for research comes a large proportion from charity. Um, and, and that's also, again, only happens because of the generosity of patients and their relatives. Um, so what, something we've been looking at recently is because patients are so central to the whole thing, it's the whole reason, isn't it? It's the whole reason of doing this. It's, it's really important we listen to patients when we're trying to work out what should we be researching? What are the most important questions to try and answer? And so I've been fortunate to be um, leading the, um, with the with the European Glaucoma Society an initiative to try and determine what are the most important research priorities for glaucoma. I don't have the answer yet because we're still going through this process, but um, we surveyed patients across Europe. And these are so far, these this list uh, were the priorities that patients ranked as the highest so far. So the number one priority is treatments to restore vision. Number two was better ways to stop vision being lost in the first place. Number three was finding a cure. Perhaps there's some overlap there. Um, and better ways to avoid needing an operation. So better medical treatments. Treatments to help keep patients independent. Treatments with fewer side effects and improved diagnostic tests. And this was just the top. There are far more underneath this. Um, so hopefully within the next few months um, we'll be able to uh, work with patients and with the clinicians to come up with a, a list of the top priorities that we we agree on and that we can focus on going forward so i think that's the end of my presentation so i hope you found that interesting and um if anyone's uh, has sent any questions into philippa I'll, I'll do my best to try and answer them Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you so much for that. You make things that are actually very complicated sound a lot more straightforward. I think everyone would agree that, um, yeah, you've made it sound more common sense. You know, we can understand it a lot more. So thank you so much for that. I particularly like your alphabet soup. 
uh, yeah. analogy of of the of the trials that have been happening it's difficult to kind of keep up with all the initials and stuff uh, that people use um yeah questions are coming in um, can i just ask as well everybody put your questions into the q a box and i can put them to andrew we've had a few in already so if you're ready andrew here we go um first one hit you in, in it, it straight on with a hard one here sorry about that <laughs> Has there been any research? I'm allowed to talk <laughs> We're not paying you enough. Uh, <laughs> have you got any research information about Q enzyme Q10 uh, and glaucoma, please? Any information? Yeah. Um, so the the studies that have been looking at coenzyme Q10, because that that for those of you who aren't aware, that's a it's similar in a way to the nicotinamide, the vitamin B3, in that there are there is some thought that it might be a neuroprotective agent and again it's a bit like nicotinamide because it's readily available it's very cheap you can get it in a pharmacy in, i'm sorry in holland and barrow boots or somewhere so i um but um there uh, there at the moment it hasn't got quite the same level of evidence as nicotinamide it's mainly been studies actually in animals where where it's um uh, been shown promise um and um yeah so we haven't we have still haven't got enough uh, data to support its use um wi widely in in humans um mm -hmm. but yeah it's another interesting one and the other thing that there the other um uh, sort of supplement that there was a lot of interest in as well was um ginkgo as well ginkgo a few years ago was recommended mm -hmm. um and that that improves blood flow improves blood supply but it can also increase bleeding so people who are taking aspirin or um blood thinners shouldn't have really been taking it and again i think there there still isn't good evidence for it either i think it's gone out of fashion a little bit mm -hmm. um, i was going to say it must be so difficult for researchers to kind of you know that there'll be things that come in that are fads almost you know things that seem quite interesting but are they actually as effective it must be difficult for researchers to kind of really focus on the things because funding is limited uh on the things they really think are going to make a difference true i mean the problem, there's different levels of evidence so really for something to really change practice no no for imagine if if we wanted to use nicotinamide mm -hmm. and we need what we need is a randomized trial um so you'd have to have a group of people taking a tablet which was basically like a sugar pill mm -hmm. and a group of people taking nicotinamide and and those people wouldn't know what they were taking and the and the doctors wouldn't know that's that's the way to do a proper study and so unless you have that evidence it can be quite difficult no, you can, yeah, it's hard to recommend things. And studies in animals as well. You know, how relevant are they to humans? Because when they do studies in animals, they you know they don't they they create glaucoma artificially. It's not really glaucoma. So, no, of course. Um, yeah. And, and I suppose as well, there's the ethics around it as yeah. well. Of you know, if you're doing that kind of trial, you're you're having to be very aware that you may be giving someone something that potentially assists, but obviously you need to give someone else something that potentially isn't going to be I mean, uh, yeah. true i mean even with nicotinamide i mean um you'd think well this is available in in holland and barrett and not on prescription and shows surely it's safe but um the doses that are recommended at, mo at the moment for, for the study are quite high and right okay and take it's far more than you get through your diet and so there is a potential for harm. I think it's quite a low potential, but um, that that's the reason of having having a randomized a randomized control trial. Right, I see. So you have to go through that process, don't you? And it always feels like um, with these things, you know, I'm a, I'm quite impatient. I want these things to happen now. I want to be able to say, right, look, we've heard some stuff about it. Let's give it a go. But you have to go through these processes, don't you? The kind of random controlled trials and stuff like that. And it's quite lengthy, isn't it? Those processes. Um, well, they they you think they were in the past, but actually, one of the really good things about the UK glaucoma study was that they found that the study was two years. So oh. they found they found no because glaucoma is quite slow for most people. Fortunately, it can take quite. You'd think well, it would take a long time to see is one group getting worse more quickly than the other, mm -hmm. but by seeing during the study, they saw people quite frequently. And they were able to detect the difference in only two years. So I think I think it's possible. The good news is it's cheaper than to do a study and the results are available quicker to benefit people quicker. So, um, yeah, doing a glaucoma in two years is now feasible. 
it, I was going to say it looks amazing. You know, we're seeing some of the the the, the reality of of the light trial and stuff coming into practice now, and then looking at the glorious study, you know, and and stuff there, and about how you know laser as a first line treatment is possibly just coming in, and then it could be not many years before a different type of laser is used for. You know, it, it's fascinating how quickly it's doing. It's almost like the process has become a little bit more compact, or yeah, yeah. yeah. No, particularly with the laser because we, we still don't actually know exactly how it works <laughs> but it works but it works exactly yeah. um i've got some questions here one of the things uh, you spoke about was genetics um and someone's here saying can we ask our hospital to give us genetic testing um i know that we, we had for glaucoma uk we've got a talk on our youtube channel that anthony coalja did about uh, glaucoma and genetics um but yeah do you think this is something we're going to see in the future that people might be able to have their genetics tested for glaucoma yeah. Well, at present, it is possible for very select families to have genetic testing for glaucoma. But that's really for people who develop glaucoma in childhood, because that's where the strongest genetic element is and where a single gene can cause the glaucoma. So there are there is a small proportion of people who have a, a single genetic mutation which can be tested for. And, um, and, and then that can be used to try and you know inform people about the risk for relatives so that that but that's a quite an unusual situation so it isn't I, I don't think it'd be something that people would generally ask for because it's something that probably would be offered but I, I suppose if you have a child with glaucoma then yes I would ask the question um, or if you get glaucoma when you're in your teens you should perhaps ask the question particularly if there's a strong family history but for everybody else I'm afraid it's a bit too complex at the moment because there are those more than 110 locations um, that are linked to glaucoma and they don't explain all glaucoma either mm -hmm. but um, so um, but it yeah so I'm um, at the moment no but in the future potentially yes Absolutely. And more research just needs to be done, doesn't it? That's fascinating yes. stuff. I've got a question about uh, nicotinamide. Yeah, yeah. Someone's written me some lovely long words that I need to pronounce. Say, what type of nicotinamide? Mononucleotide or riboside slide? Oh, dear. I don't know. That's a very technical <laughs> nicotinamide <laughs> question. We'll have to ask Ted, really. We'll have to ask uh, Professor Brown. Yeah, well, I'd have to check the protocol of the study. I don't know. I don't know yes. the answer to that. Sorry. Well, uh, we we will have some of that. What one of the things that um that um Professor Garraway is doing is keeping Glaucoma UK uh, abreast of the study and what's yeah. happening there. So, um, yeah, have a look on our website, and if not, there if it is on on there, phone our helpline, and we'll be able to find out for you. Yeah, but I don't know if I'd recommend it yet to people. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I also, it's really important to realise it's not nicotine because I just had this image of you know, telling somebody to take nicotinamide and they come back covered in nicotine patches, smoking, <laughs> saying, I thought you said nicotine. You'd be like, I feel great. I feel fantastic. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, no good for the eyes. Uh, yeah, somebody saying here after two months of 500 milligrams nicotinamide, I had two optic disc bleeds and a large unexplained bruise. Have you heard of more similar incidents? Yeah, this is why we need to do a randomized control trial, really, because I don't know if that would be related to the nicotinamide because optic disc hemorrhage is happening in glaucoma. And, yeah. and but, so if you're in a study and that happened, then that would be reported and it would, you'd, it would the study would look and see what did that happen to more than one person. And, yeah. um, but the good thing about optic disc hemorrhage is, I mean, they're not very nice, but they do, they do go away and they usually don't affect the vision, but they just show a slightly increased risk of progression in the future. So you need to, yeah, yeah, be careful. Absolutely. Um, so I'm saying, is the new type of SLT already in use or is it just being studied at this stage? Yeah, I don't I don't think it's commercially available. I don't know anywhere in the UK where they're, they're using that apart from for the glorious uh, study. Okay, so we're waiting for the results of that. Yeah, we don't know if it's going to actually give be better, give better results. But I think the, the very attractive thing about it is it's just very easy to do, very convenient, very quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. As technologies and laser are coming on, you know, I, I can imagine that's amazing. Um, got a good question here. Are there any new types of eye drops being created that you know? Yeah, of? That is a good question, isn't it? Because there hasn't been much happen with eye drops for a long time. And, um, you know, the big breakthrough was in the 90s, the mid 90s, when we had um, latanoprost, the prostagand analog, that kind of revolutionized glaucoma treatment. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then more recently, we've had the preservative free drops, which can be useful for some people. Not everyone needs preservative free, but those people that have dry, uncomfortable eyes can be very useful. 
And then we also have the drops that are combined, the fixed dose combinations they're called, so two medications in one bottle. Yeah. But um, we have we have got a new, um, for the first time in many years, there is a new product term actually, a completely new drug, which is called um, it's a, it's called a rho kinase inhibitor, um, and um, that works in a different way to all of the other drugs as well. So it actually, it works in a similar way to SLT. It increases drainage through the trabecular meshwork through the normal drainage pathway, which surprisingly none of the other drops do. So there is, um, there is a new drop which will be available um, I, I think it's going to be within the next year or so, but um, it, like all medications, it has side effects. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I don't think it's going to be the very first line treatment. I think it might be second or third choice, but it, it will give another option to people. And options are important, aren't they? Because it's not one size fits all with glaucoma. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody responds differently to different treatments and, yeah, it doesn't, there is exactly, and and it's really important as well. You know, with SLT, for instance, a study says that it works well as first line treatment, but some people might not not like the thought of having a laser, and they'd rather have drops, and that's not unreasonable. No, really, it's up to the person. So, people... which leads to some someone <laughs> saying here, you know, what would be an example of someone who would not be compatible with laser? You know, yeah, sometimes yeah. people can't have that, can they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think well, I think it's always good to look at the kind of person that was in the study. So in the light study, they didn't include people who had advanced glaucoma or people who had very high pressure because um, it might, you know, those people I'd worry about doing laser on as a first off treatment. So for instance, if you've, if you've got quite bad glaucoma, the laser does wear off. And so it might work well initially, but then if it's if it's worn off and, you, and nobody really knows it's worn off, mm -hmm. you could potentially have high pressure and not realize it. And for, for a lot of people, that might not matter if the glaucoma is very early, mm -hmm. but some advanced glaucoma is probably not 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 so good, so good. And it and it's not it tends to work as well as about one or maybe two eye drops. So if you're on quite a few drops, then it probably isn't going to be quite as effective. What is effective? Uh, someone was, was mentioning to us on Facebook how they've got advanced glaucoma and they've had aqua shunts done. And basically it was like, what is the research to really say that aqua shunts can kind of help with advanced glaucoma? But I suppose with that as well, if someone has got advanced glaucoma um, and they've lost a lot of sight, you know, th there's, I suppose it's, is there, what's the benefits of doing these kind of things if you've already lost mm -hmm. quite a lot of sight? You know, is, is it important to still keep the eye pressure low? Um, yeah. Well, we, we set what we call a target pressure um, and the target pressure depends on the person, their, their, um, the, the, how bad their disease is. Um, so if, you, if you've got very bad damage from glaucoma, you really need a very low pressure, normally sort of near, near 10, low teens, definitely. Mm -hmm. And so um, some treatments have a better chance of getting that very low pressure um, than others. Um, so surgery is going is, is often more effective at getting a low pressure than medications are. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so um, again, it's a very it's a very individual thing. So and sometimes sometimes we set a pressure when we first meet someone, we often we we don't always know exactly what the right pressure is. So we might think a pressure of fifteen is okay, and and then find that somebody gets a little bit worse, and then we have to say, well, actually, you probably need a pressure of ten. Or we might find that the pressure, somebody's not getting worse and we can actually increase the target pressure. Which is often when we speak to people about pressure. And, you know, as I said, we often use the, the example in the waiting room of someone saying, well, what's your pressure? Or oh, my pressure is this. Or oh, what's yours? Or oh, yeah, mine's yeah, this, you, you know. Compare. You can't compare what's different. No, you can't. And that that's actually, I often, I, I check the pressure and I often will say to someone, oh, your pressure's 16. And they say, is that okay? And, Oh, I don't actually know if it's okay because I have to look and see what was the pressure at the beginning, how bad is the glaucoma, and um, there's so many factors you have to take into account because it's individual. Mm. Absolutely, I've got a couple about home monitoring here that I'm kind of trying to roll in. One person saying I heard something about a special glove that could read your eye pressure. Oh yes, yeah, there is. Yeah, what's this one about? Yeah, it. it won an award. It, I think it was in Singapore they developed this, and so. That's right. Yeah, it has a, it's a glove with a little sensor on that you use to just press the eye. And so I've not, I've not actually seen that, but it looks fascinating. It looks, yeah, another way potentially to check the pressure at home. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's the oldest way of checking the pressure. You know, if you went back 200 years, people would just touch the eye and say, well, that feels very hard. And that's, <laughs> that feels like glaucoma. 
Wow, so you're almost really go, going back it's to the old back. methods. It's gone medieval again, yes. Absolutely, it all goes in circles. Um, <laughs> yeah. And another thing here, someone's saying that their particular situation, they're saying, can testing pressure at home work on eyes that have had corneal grafts? So I suppose, is home pressure testing going to work on everyone? Yeah, yeah. Is it accurate? I mean, the answer is not everyone is going to be able to do home monitoring. And, and actually, well, I suppose the bigger question is, is it actually useful for anyone? And we don't know. We still don't really know. So, um um, and then the second question is that, yeah, is it is it actually accu accurate? Mm -hmm. um, and if even if it is useful, we, we found in our studies that about 25 percent of people can't do it. And, um, you know, it, uh, and that that's it is quite it can be quite challenging for some people. Mm -hmm. And they might be the people who need it most, the people that um, you know, who can't do it. Um, but that specific question about corneal grafts, mm -hmm. well, um, yeah, I, when that's what because of most ways we check pressure, we're checking it through the cornea. So um, you probably hope people are probably aware now that we tend to measure the thickness of the cornea um, at least once. It doesn't tend to change that much mm. because that can influence the pressure we're trying to measure through the cornea, the clear window into the eye. So if you've had a corneal graph, that can that can certainly affect the accuracy of pressure measurements, mm. uh, but not just the home monitor, the checking in clinic as well. Mm. Yeah. I suppose in clinic, I suppose there's more of a controlled environment in terms of there's people to take that into account, isn't there? I that suppose. Also but... true, yeah, because yeah, that's absolutely true. Mm. So, because if you're checking your pressure at home, you know, can we be sure it's accurate? You know, if you get one high reading, mm. is it genuine? And it's very, it's very hard to know. And that's why I imagine these trials and these tests do take a while because you need to be able to take all these things into account and make sure things that work in a lab also work in real life and when you're dealing with human behavior it's we're not all straightforward are we no. but <laughs> I suppose the other thing is that we, we shouldn't we've spoken a lot again about pressure as well but mm. I think we all can focus on pressure too much mm. um, because it's not the most important thing and I I or, or I kind of feel that patients think about pressure because that's what they're told when they come they, and then they because that's the question they asked you know, what's my pressure but actually before they found out they had glaucoma they weren't worried about the pressure at all what, what people tend to be worried about is their sight yes. so really really we should i think we should be more worried about you no know, how's my visual field what what's my what's my vision like and uh, because the pressure because of all these you know, limitations of pressure it, it can be right it's not always the best thing to focus on of course of course absolutely yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a really good one here. Uh, you mentioned that environmental factors can be a, a factor in developing glaucoma as well as genetic factors. What are the common environmental factors? Yeah, well, the until recently, we found there are factors that can influence the pressure, but they, we, it wasn't really known whether they affect glaucoma. So you know, we know if you stand on your head that your eye pressure goes up, or mm -hmm. if you wear a really tight tie, the pressure can be higher, or... <laughs> You're doing some extreme yoga then you know you, your pressure can be higher but we don't actually know that any of those things actually would make glaucoma worse are they actually of any significance but recently some really nice studies that show exercise is is beneficial so um uh there, there's they've looked at um you know how far people travel in terms of steps per day and those that are more active seem to have a slower rate of change and, and less less deterioration so i think in terms of environmental factors exercise is good it's beneficial um there is some evidence that pollution is not very good so there have been some sort of population studies where they look at um uh, where people live and in terms of pollution and road, air pollution so that there's some evidence that might not be so good um, um but mo most of the environmental things are more related to the pressure than actual glaucoma damage actually so i, I the advice the advice i, I always give is you know, the things that are good for your body in general all of those things that you know, not smoking exercising eating lots of green vegetables those sort of things are going to be good for your eyes absolutely all the boring things that we need uh, to do uh, <laughs> but absolutely but they seem to be the things that we we say to people as well you know look after yeah. yourself generally uh, at the moment is is all we can I say know. i also sometimes people are worried they become very worried that they shouldn't be doing things and they really restrict their life because of the diagnosis and maybe for some of those people their risk actually is quite low anyway and so i i'd always say try to just live your life to your fullest and don't try to let it affect you and restrict you in what you do and because uh, yeah 
there's enough Absolutely. worries in our life without worrying about things that might not happen in terms of vision absolutely absolutely <laughs> i've got two more quick ones and we'll have to kind of go through these quite quick but um somebody's saying here can you explain the omni surgical system oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how often does it need to be repeated all oh, right so well there's in terms of surgery you, there's there's two, there's different types of surgery so the the the, the sort of most tried and tested operation is a trabeculectomy okay so that if you need if you've got advanced glaucoma and you, and you want the pressure to be 10 that's usually the best operation is a trabeculectomy but then there are newer types of operations so there's there's some tubes that can be put in so it, like a trabeculectomy basically shunts the fluid to the under the conjunctiva under the white part of the eye and it creates a bleb like a reservoir mm -hmm. so um trabeculectomy does that and the tube operations do that there's an operation called a micro shunt that does that too. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other types of operations, which are, are they're called minimally invasive glaucoma surgery or MIGS. And they don't create a bleb. They, they try to restore drainage through the natural drainage system. Mm -hmm. so, um, so if your drainage system is completely blocked up, they're probably not going to work. You probably need something else that bypasses that. So the, the Omni is just one of those procedures that, that is classified as a MIGS procedure. Okay. And um, uh, and it, so it basically tries to restore the natural drainage channel. Um, and it's a bit hard to answer that one because it's quite a specific thing about an individual person, I think. Of course. Of, but most, of, to be honest, most of surgery, if a surgery is performed and it doesn't work, it probably shouldn't be repeated. You probably should think about, should you do something else? Absolutely right. See something else going to work. Absolutely. And there's, yeah, of course, lots yeah. of uh, lots of research into the MIGS kind of stuff. There's lots of new products kind of coming about. So, yeah, that, yeah. I'm not going to talk about that now, though, because otherwise I'll run out of time with you. And I've got one more question here. And this will be our last one tonight. Um, is there any research being done into no the normal tension glaucoma that continues to worsen? And someone said here, worsen when trabeculectomy has successfully lowered iop so yeah normal tension i mean that's something we get a lot of questions about do we know any research into, yeah. into that normal tension glaucoma is difficult um and um because yeah obviously most people who get glaucoma of high pressure in their eyes but mm. if you get if you get glaucoma very low pressure there's different reasons why that could happen mm. the first thing we always need to do is just question is it definitely glaucoma because there are other things that can affect the optic nerve mm -hmm. um and then we have to think about well why why is that person getting damaged with a low pressure and it could be that the pressure is fluctuated so maybe for people like that checking the pressure more often maybe at home maybe that would be useful we don't know um or it might be that the pressure is consistently really low but the optic nerve is just very fragile and it doesn't like that pressure it's, the pressure is too high for that person and there are other factors like the blood supply to the nerve and the the, the mitochondria in the nerve that, that, that could be supported by nicotinamide potentially or other things so i think um i think the research looking at neuroprotection at treatments that work other than by lowering intraocular pressure will be very very useful for people who have normal tension glaucoma that's excellent thank you so so much andrew we're just about running out of time um so i'm gonna have to stop stop the questions there but thank you to everybody who's put some questions in and thank you andrew for both your really really interesting uh presentation but also as i said the way you break that down to make it understandable to us all so I, that's much appreciated what i'm going to do is um just share now my uh my screen um, and tell you a little bit about what we've got coming up. What I'm going to do at the same time is put up my poll. So let me know how much you feel you learn about this presentation, uh, whether you feel more informed. I'm going to launch that now and that will come up onto your, um, should come up uh, in a second. So if you could answer that question for me, how much do you feel you kind of learn now? While I'm doing that, I'm going to tell you a few details about our helpline. You can call the Glaucoma UK helpline between Monday and Friday, 9.30 till 5. If we haven't got round to your question today, um, and I know there was one about cataracts and, uh, and cataract surgery that, that was on my list and didn't quite make it into the end there, please phone our helpline. Or can you also uh, email us at helpline at glaucoma.uk and we will give you answers to that. That one you put in is relatively straightforward. So give us a, a shout on our helpline and we'll be able to help you with that. Um, over the next uh, coming week, uh, sorry, not coming week, coming month or so, we have a couple of uh, DGSGs coming up. The first one we've got is um, one that we did a, a, a presentation about um, 
a pseudo exfoliation glaucoma, a type of glaucoma a few years ago, and that was very popular. And people said to us, come on, do one about pigment disper dispersion glaucoma, please. So we've got um, Dr. Sin Neg from uh, Cardiff going to be talking to us about pigment dispersion on the 20th of October at 10 a.m. And then we have a, another talk on the 3rd of November about Charles Bonnet syndrome. And that's going to be delivered by Judith Potts, who is the founder of Esme's Umbrella, who is the uh, charity for, for people who have Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, thank you so much for doing that poll. That's absolutely wonderful. I'm going to close that down. Um, right. OK, just a, a, a quick few things. If you could please think about completing uh, the survey that you'll get on your um, emails uh, to tell us how you think these DGSCs are going. We really appreciate it because we put all of your suggestions and ideas into the pot for our next set. We want these sessions to be great. So the more feedback you can give us, the better. Thank you so much. And a massive, massive thank you to Andrew today for giving up his evening to talk to us today. Andrew, absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you so much. And thank you to Kay, who was on the Facebook as well. Hope to see you all maybe in a couple of weeks. Thanks again. Uh, have a lovely evening and goodbye. <laughs>